Hello, budding political theorists. This is Dr. Phillips, and today I want to talk to you about Aristotle and the purpose of government, part one. Now, this is going to be a two-part lecture. I tried squeezing everything I wanted to communicate about Aristotle into one lecture, and it was just too much. The politics and the Nicomachean ethics are incredibly rich books to study, and even focusing on the outline of Aristotle's vision of the purpose of government is going to take two lectures, and um, actually we could probably take a whole semester to, to go through the entire book um, with how many interesting uh, things are in there, but sadly we don't have that amount of time. So let's think about what the purpose of government is. This kind of question is a question that ultimately cashes out uh, into a decision about what a polity's constitution should be like. Polity here is another word for a state or a political entity. What powers should a government have? What limits should be imposed upon it? That's what constitutions tend to do. They tend to empower governments to do certain things and to disable governments from doing other things. Now, Aristotle's approach is maybe slightly different when he's talking about purpose. Although he does want to ultimately ask or answer a question about what the best constitution is like, his idea of purpose is wrapped up in this idea of teleology. Now, teleology is a fancy word that means that everything in this world has a natural purpose. It's moving towards some end state. And Aristotle's example is the acorn. The telos of an acorn is to become an oak tree. The telos of a baby is to become an adult. The idea is that the, the, this is what will happen if you naturally let these things develop. When something has reached its end state, uh, Aristotle thinks it's the most perfect version of itself. Aristotle also thought that something reached its telos would be in a kind of balance. It wouldn't be tending towards anything else because it would uh, ultimately have, have reached a kind of steady state. Uh, a thing's telos, therefore, or its purpose, is its inner principle of motion, the reason that causes it to change over time. So once that end has been reached, and that is in some sense its essence, essence or um, its true nature at some level. So when Aristotle is looking for the purpose of the state, he's looking for an inner, inner principle that will eventually bring it to balance. Uh, Aristotle concludes that the state will ultimately exist to serve human purposes. In that way, the state is not an end in itself. Its telos is derivative of the telos of human beings. Uh, it is good for the sake of something else, uh, that is namely us. This means, though, that to find out what the purpose of government is for, we have to solve a prior question, the question of what human life is for. What is our purpose? What is our telos? Uh, in other words, we've replaced a question that looked like it might be tractable with something that's a, a lot more complicated. But note the assumptions embedded uh, in his argument, or even in his question, right? His, uh, he assumes that human life has a purpose, that human life has one overarching purpose rather than many, and that the purpose is the same for all human beings. That is to say that your purpose for living, your telos, is the same as mine. But once we get past those issues, uh, in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle uh, reasons that if human life has a purpose, an end towards which it tends, we can discover it by asking people or observing people. And this is actually something I do in my in-person classes. Each semester, I will ask one of my students, why do you go to school? And he or she will often answer, well, I want to get a job. And then I ask them, well, why do you want to get a job? And they usually answer something like, well, I want to pay for food, shelter, entertainment. And then I ask them, well, why do you want those things? And the student often comes back with, well, Without those things, I'm unhappy, and with them, I am happier. Uh, and then I ask them, why do you want to be happy? And this is where the student encounters more difficulty, because it's hard to figure out what the answer is here. What do we want to be happy for? Often, people just say, well, we want to be happy because we want to be happy. In other words, you want happiness for its own sake, not for the sake of something else. And this is where Ar Aristotle says, aha, gotcha. Uh, it seems that we found an answer to the question of what the inner principle of motion drives human beings. Uh, he calls this answer eudaimonia. Um, it can loosely be translated as happiness, or maybe a better translation would be the good life. But Aristotle is very quick to point out that happiness or the good life doesn't mean just pleasure or desire fulfillment. The good life for Aristotle 
is not just pleasure, because it's possible to have a life full of pleasure and still regret one's life. Perhaps our life lacked meaning or lacked authenticity or it just simply wasn't worthy of admiration. We can look back on our lives after a long life and say, well, I had a lot of fun, but it didn't amount to very much. On the other hand, the good life is not also is not just getting what you want. Um, sometimes we get a lot of what we want, but we realize that what we want wasn't good for us, or maybe we realize that once we want it, once we have it, we don't really want it anymore. Sometimes we might want things that are slightly shameful, things that we shouldn't want. We might take pleasure in the pain of a rival. Uh, and those kinds of getting what you want um, doesn't seem like it's conducive to a good life. So Aristotle is skeptical that the good life is wholly a question, uh, a subjective question. But he doesn't go to the other extreme. He doesn't say it's wholly objective either. In other words, he says that a life without good health or sufficient wealth to meet our physical needs, that isn't a good life either, uh, a good human life. Note that Aristotle is probably treading into controversial territory here, um, or at least a territory that today we would find somewhat controversial, because on his view, the poor and the disabled cannot have a good life, a fully human life. Those lives might be worth living, but those people are not reaching their telos. They cannot be fully good because in some sense they are missing some part of what makes a life good. Okay, now, so like most good or perfect things for Aristotle, eudaimonia must be seen as a balance. And if you remember anything about Aristotle, remember the idea of the golden mean, that uh, every good is a kind of balance between extremes. One helpful way to see what he's getting at is to think about the difference between lives to envy and lives to admire. Or if you want to get very concrete about it, the difference between Martin Luther King Jr. and Kobe Bryant, the difference between Abraham Lincoln and Playboy founder Hugh Hefner, or Mother Teresa, and well, you get the picture, right? At the end of the day, Aristotle thinks a good human life needs to be a balanced one. And we can see this if we take the perspective of someone looking back at their life. What would make it the case that the person truly had no regrets? Okay, so Aristotle has built his case for eudaimonia, being this balance between life to envy and life to admire, and that really being the telos of humanity, that end that we all seek uh, for the sake of which we acquire wealth, we acquire power, uh, and so on and so forth. Note, by the way, how this telos is both supposed to be descriptive. It really must be the case, if Aristotle's right, that normal people are driven to seek eudaimonia. Uh, but it also has to be the case that this idea of telos is normative, that we should seek eudaimonia, and that what makes life better is doing more of it, that is to say, achieving more eudaimonia. Uh, I think a lot of people are skeptical about this aspect of Aristotle, uh, his attempt to bridge the is-ought gap, uh, and, he think, and they think he needs to choose. Um, either eudaimonia is a goal to be strived for, or it is the goal that we actually strive for. I don't think Aristotle sees it this way, and it's not a debate that we're going to solve today. In any event, Aristotle's next move in the Nicomachean Ethics is to try and explain how human beings can achieve their telos. But that is going to be the subject of our next lecture.